who in here who sang that song but doubt that that's true for you? Think, well, Jesus doesn't, I mean, Jesus knows what I did. Jesus knows who I was. Jesus knows the life that I've lived. And he may like me some, but he can't love me because of that junk. And I'm telling you, that ain't true. It's not true. Jesus loves every one of us. No matter the junk, no matter the stuff, no matter the crap that we are involved in, he still loves us. Now, make no mistake, his love for us is not justification of the junk. Okay, sin is still sin. It doesn't, his love for you doesn't justify your lifestyle. We got to get right with God. But he does love you. Take that in this morning. Let's confirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And kids, you may be dismissed. Did I get that right? All right. Sorry, John, not you. All right, two weeks ago, there was a, a kind of a holiday, kind of a Christian holiday. What holiday was that? Easter. Easter. What do we celebrate on Easter? Resurrection. Resurrection of Jesus. And then last week, we started a, 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 just a small sermon series where we're talking about the first thing. So it's the first things that Jesus did as the resurrected Lord. And, and the first thing that he did was what? appeared to Mary Magdalene. He, she, he picked Mary Magdalene as the first person that he would appear in his resurrected form to, revealed to, and which is where our name comes from. We talked about all of that last week. So today, I want to, oh, today I'm going to try not to break speakers, and uh, we want to keep talking about what happened on that day. So let's go to Luke 24, Luke 24, and start in verse 13. Um, is there, still a, is there still a box of Bibles back there under the pew? Yeah, so if you need a Bible, want one, put your hand in the air. Uh, that young man sitting at the end of the row, he didn't know it, but he just got volunteered to be the, the Bible guy <laughs> if somebody needs one. Luke 24, Luke 24, going to start verse 13. Uh, what is your sub-chapter heading for verse 13? The road to Emmaus. So we're going to tell that story today. That story today. Uh, starting at verse 13, are we good? The Bible pass out guy, are we good? Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, all right. Verse 13. Behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Two of them were going that very day. What day? That day. What day was that? Yes, that was Easter morning. That was resurrection day. That's the very same day that we're talking about. Verse 14, they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. All these things which had taken place. What things? Crucifixion of Jesus would be a thing. Resurrection would be a thing. The betrayal by Judas would be a thing. The arrest of Jesus would be a thing. The mock trial that they put on would be a thing. The releasing of Barabbas, the, the murderer, would be a thing. Just all of those events would be a thing that you would be talking about as you're walking seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. This was a, an event that, in well, we track time based off of this event, okay? 
Even people who don't believe in Jesus, they believe it's 2024. They're tracking their time based off of that event. So these two guys that are, well, these two individuals that are walking from Jerusalem to, to uh, Emmaus are talking about, the, there was plenty to talk about. Plenty to talk about. While they were talking, verse 15, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. I've been asked many times, Pastor, what does that mean? It means their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. So he was in a disguise. It means that their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. So that means that he looked different. It means that their eyes were prevented from... I don't know what that means! I just know they couldn't tell it was Jesus. Okay? I, I, I don't know. Should I take this off? Okay. Let me get rid of this. Who Cleopas was? 
So there's a story earlier in Scripture, earlier in the Gospel accounts, where, so you remember, you have Jesus was, he had 12 disciples, right? And then around those 12 disciples, there was a series of, of, of there were some Marys there, Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary, who was an aunt. Uh, you have some other Marys, and then you have another group that were referred to as the 70. And the 70 were oftentimes sent out uh, on mission. And Cleopas was one of the 70. Okay, so Cleopas wouldn't have known of Jesus. He would have known Jesus. All right? Not as close as the 12, certainly not as close as the inner three, which would have been Peter, James, and John, but, but he would have known. It wouldn't have been like, hey, is that Jesus? Well, he would have known Jesus. All right, so um, Cleopas had this intimate understanding of who Jesus was, what he looked like, all of those kinds of things. Cleopas doesn't recognize him. But it's interesting that Cleopas is walking away from Jerusalem on, on uh, Easter morning. And he says to Jesus, who he thinks is a stranger, are you the only one? Are you the only one who has no idea what's going on here the last couple days? And then Jesus says, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God, and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all of this, it's the third day since. Can you hear the anguish? This is, this is the guy who when Jesus said, hey, what are you talking about? And they looked at the ground and they couldn't figure out how to answer the question. we got to recognize some 2,000 years later that these were just not events that you're reading in a history book. That these were events that not only affected the, 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 the not only affected the, the human beings that were attached to it then, but they affect it now. You can't live life and not recognize that that happened. There's no event besides creation more important than that. Amen. Nothing. <clears throat> whether you embrace it or whether you don't, <clears throat> does it make a difference to the fact that that tomb is empty? When people ask me, well, religion, I mean, uh, Christianity, it's just, it's just like Islam. It's just like this. It's just like... Uh, and I, I, I should have had a list prepared, but I don't because I'm, you know, going off the rail right now. But as you look at all of the different religions across the world, they all have one thing in common. They all have a champion. Every one of them has a champion. What they don't have in common is only one of them has an empty tomb. All the rest of them have filled tombs. I'm not going to kneel and worship at a tomb that has a body in it. I'm going to kneel and worship at the empty tomb. John, how do you know it's real? Because the tomb's empty. That's my validation. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's about that. And you can't escape that. And as these guys are walking away, and they're saying to Jesus, who they don't know is Jesus, he was a prophet. He was Jesus. He was mighty in deed and word, sight of God, all the people and the chief priests who should have known better. And the rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and they crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. And some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning, they did not find his body. They came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, <laughs> but him they did not see.
just don't listen to women. <laughs> <laughs> to our detriment. Amen? Yeah. I, I just want the men to amen here. I don't want the women to amen. <laughs> to our detriment. <laughs> now, if you go back farther from that, far, like, what were the inner conversations with Noah and his wife? Hey, you really should put another pen right there because the rabbits are going to multiply. Ah, uh, we don't need it. I don't know what all those conversations would have been like, but it seems that history is full and full and full and full of God revealing himself where intuitively the, the, the woman gets it and the guy is still resistive to it. Is that pride on our part? Is that just stupidity on our part? I'm not sure what it is, but it's consistent. <laughs> and Jesus said, oh, foolish men. Oh, foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory. Now, we know that Jesus said that. But Cleopas and friend didn't know that that was Jesus speaking. What they heard was a stranger who had just been walking along with them and who said, hey, what's going on in the city? What's, what's all it? What do you mean? How can you not know? How can you have been visiting and not understand all of this going on? What things? The things about Jesus the Nazarene. And they said this. And they hit this, and they hit crucifixion, they hit all these, these women went and said, they, well, the tomb is empty, so the body's not there. We don't even know what to make of that. And then this stranger says, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Who is qualified to even say that? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Verse 27, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. There's a, there's a lot of stories in here that I'm like, man, I would love to see that. David and Goliath, oh, I would love to see that. Oh. Yeah, I mean, there's lots and lots and lots of stories that I would love to see. I wanted to walk here. I wanted to be the fourth member of this group and listen to the stranger that was really Jesus start at Moses, start at the Exodus, and explain how all of this is about him. I want to hear that. I don't know if they got that on tape delay up in heaven. I don't know how that part works, but I want to hear it. I want to hear as though he were going further. So you can picture Cleopas and friend like turning off to go to village and, and Jesus disguised as traveler is going to keep going straight. And they urged him saying, stay with us for it's getting toward evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. Went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their <coughs> eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. <coughs> Just a couple chapters earlier in Luke 22, uh, in verse 14, okay, it says, When the hour had come, <coughs> He reclined, Jesus, at the table and the apostles with him. The apostles meaning the twelve. Okay? Now, there, there may have been some other... We've all seen the, 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 the painting of the, of the Last Supper. Okay? you got to understand, that's like an artist's rendition of, of the story. Don't take that as like a photograph. All right? We're not really sure how many people were at this quote, <laughs> Last Supper, but we know that the apostles, that the disciples were there. And he said, Jesus said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled 
in the kingdom of God. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Is any of this familiar to you? Yeah. Don't we do this every week? Yeah. I mean, every week we do this. Same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, The cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is, is, is with mine on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. This is the Last Supper. I don't know if Cleopas was there. I don't know. I know that the disciples were but I don't know if Cleopas was there. Even if Cleopas was not there, I think he would have known about it. I think the words would have been familiar enough to him that, that um, when, when Jesus starts to break the bread with Cleopas, that the, like the little bell starts to ring in the back of your head where you're like, wait a minute, this is somewhat familiar, and then he's recognized as Jesus, and then he's gone. <clears throat> the great question there is, gone to where? Gone to where? So I've heard that explained a couple different ways. I've heard gone to Jerusalem. I've heard gone to the bread and the wine, like gone into the bread and the wine. And I've heard gone to heavenly places until his next appearance. Um, here's my official opinion. He vanished from their sight. <laughs> I don't know where. I don't know that I care. That, to me, that's not worth the argument. It's not worth the theological fight about where he disappeared to. He vanished from their sight. They got what they needed to get. And that's what we're going to talk about. Does that make sense? Okay. So in verse 32, they said to one another, Cleopas and friend, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? I, I, I can't speak for anybody else in here but myself. And you ever been in the church environment, in, in the Bible study environment, and you're listening to a speaker, and he's orating God's word, and you thought, holy cow, how does this guy know what I'm going through? <laughs> how did he know that this happened to me? How did he know that I was going to be here this morning? How did, how did he create this sermon, this story to tell, where I'm, I'm the only one in the audience he's talking to? None of these other people are affected by this. It's killing me. <laughs> Ever have anybody? You realize that's all Holy Spirit stuff, that we're not that smart? You, you realize that, right? That, that we, we should be sitting on your side over here, that this, this pulpit is not a barrier. This pulpit just holds up the notes. It's not a barrier between holiness at all. Okay? So that's a Holy Spirit thing. But that <laughs> burning that you feel, that burning that we hit, that is the Holy Spirit's, I, of course, here we have a word for that. We start to call those lightning, lightning strikes. All right, this is the Lord getting your attention. <clears throat> so in verse 33, they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the 11 and those who were with them. Why only 11? Why not 12? Judas is dead. Judas, Judas is dead, right, okay. Saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. In the breaking of the bread. So it, it really leaves, it's a great story, the road to Emmaus, but it leaves us with this question about why was Jesus recognized in the breaking of the bread, but not in the explaining of the scriptures? That's an interesting, fascinating question. I mean, so, wait a minute. I thought I could recognize Jesus if I'm reading the scriptures. I can't. In, in the particular story, he was not 
unrecognizable. But well, wait a minute, but John, but in the particular story, Jesus himself, whom the scriptures are written about, was describing the scriptures about himself, and they still didn't get it. Does that mean that we had the dumbest two people in the world walking to Emmaus? Or would it be fair to say that they were fairly representative of us? Follow what I'm saying? I really think that the answer is contained in the mystery of what love is, the mystery of love. Um, can anybody tell me the greatest command? So the stories in Scripture, the songs in Scripture, the history in Scriptures, the poetry, the prophecy, uh, all of those all of those contained here, uh, for the sake of the rest of this conversation, we're going to call that the living word. Fair enough? The living word. <clears throat> the living word, when we read it, when we engage in it, when we have relationship with it, it touches, it certainly touches our hearts. That's that burning that you feel. And it touches our minds. We grow wiser in understanding the ways of God. Is this making sense? It, reading, reading, having a, having a good uh, um, discipline in your life of reading scripture and digging into scripture and looking up the mysteries of scripture and asking questions of the text and trying to find out it creates a hunger and a curiosity within us which is good and it 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 it, uh, it helps to well we just pour concrete so I'll stay there it kind of lays the concrete again on those ancient pathways that take us back to living a life devoted unto the Lord um, so the, of all of that is good all of that is good um, but let's read, let's read John 5 really quick. John chapter 5. Uh, verse 39 is where we're going to start. Jesus is speaking and he says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. Okay, so if you think about if you think about this in the context of the road to Emmaus, as he was explaining the scriptures to them, they still weren't recognizing Jesus, even though the scriptures are speaking to Jesus. Now, if I said to you, where is eternal life found? About everybody in this room would say, in, in Jesus, in Christ. So what Jesus is saying is you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. He's saying, no, you don't have eternal life in the scriptures. You have eternal life in me. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, the scriptures speak to him. They help us understand who he is. They explain the what's, the where's, and the why's of why Jesus came. Does this make any sense? Yeah. But the scriptures themselves don't say. The scriptures point to the one who does say. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. It's the same message that Jesus is saying 
uh, uh, in, the, in the road to Emmaus. He's explaining the scriptures, explaining the scriptures, so that Cleopas and friend are like, oh, okay, oh, okay, oh, I didn't get that before. Oh, their heart and their mind are catching up with what's going to happen next. Jesus is not saying that the scriptures are bad. Jesus is saying that the scriptures prepare us to meet him. So the living word prepares our hearts, prepares our minds, our brains to meet what I'm going to call the incarnate word, which is Jesus in the flesh. So at the breaking of the bread, Jesus was recognized. Once Jesus was recognized in the breaking of the bread, he vanished to wherever he vanished to. But vanished. Make sense? So when you combine the living word and the incarnate word, you have a much more complete John the bread, the, the, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, as he receives that, he's receiving the incarnate word after hearing the living word, and when that comes together, that's what, because it hits all of you. Now it's physical. Does that make sense? that we use for what do we what do we call this if you're giving this a title what do we call this Amen. okay i got a eucharist what else i got communion, communion. Lord's supper Lord's supper any, any other ones so what what is what is communion mean what's the word Yes, but what's the word mean? Completing. Almost. Thanksgiving. Eucharist means Thanksgiving. So there is a coming together Thanksgiving that occurs at the table of God. What does Lord's Supper mean? Why do we call it the Last Supper redone? Why do we call it Lord's Supper? It is. Explain what do you mean by it's his. So he's, he's giving the supper, and the main course is him. So it's the Lord's Supper. So when we think about the words that we actually use to describe whatever this is, it is Holy Communion. It is Thanksgiving. It is Lord's Supper. It's all of those things. It's about the love that God has for us. That he not only wants us to get it cerebrally, he not only wants you to get it with a burning in your heart, he wants you to receive it physically. Because let's face it, we're holistic. When I cut my finger off, it affected me mentally and spiritually, not just physically. You can't have damage to one aspect of you without having repercussions to all aspects of you. Does that make sense? Yeah. God's love for us is all aspects. So he presents it where it hits all aspects. The living word coupled with the incarnate word is his love. Think about it as a, as, as a present that he's giving you that when you receive the present, it blesses your heart, it blesses your mind, it fortifies your soul, and it blesses your body. All of it. That's love. That's love. That's why I say the most important thing we do here on Sunday mornings is the table. Because we've prepared ourselves with the living word. We've prepared ourselves by singing.
singing his praises, by saying prayers, by reading the book, by hearing the story, by we prepared ourselves to receive it physically. Does that make sense? just, okay, so God loves us so unconditionally that his blessing is going to be meant, it's going to be a heart, soul, mind, strength, blessing. That's love. Yes. But is that the only reason? There's another aspect to that that we can't lose. And the other, I'm just going to, I'm going to put, put this away or I'm never going to stop. So the other aspect to that is, is we have to understand that, that God loves you no matter what. I think we've already established that. But we've also established that his love for you is not justification to a sinful lifestyle. Well, God loves me. Okay, but that isn't justification. You have to grow up in your faith. You have to get more mature. you got to put the crap aside. you got to get better. Why? Because God loves you with a purpose. God loves you with a mission attached. God loves you with a plan. God loves you with a will to bring others into the family. That making sense? So that means as I grow in my faith, I can draw more into the family. Make sense? With me so far. Now, how do I grow in my faith? Well, I need more of God. So when we talk about quiet time with the Lord, we talk about, hey, read your Bible. We talk about make sure you say your prayers. We're talking about learn how to love God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, and with your body, and with your strength. So how do I receive that love back from the Lord to empower me to love the world around me with all of me. Combine the living word and the incarnate word. When you combine that in your, in your expressions of your faith, that empowers you, it shields you, it prepares you, it marks you, it makes you his more and more and more, which What's the right word? Enables, maybe. Empowers, maybe. Um, all of a sudden, your, your will starts to line up with God. So, so your, uh, your, your desires and motivations are more in line with what your mission and your calling is. Now, again, half of you are saying, I, I'm just trying to get clean, man. I, I, I don't have no mission. I don't have no calling. I'm, I'm, not, going to, I'm not going anywhere to tell it. Pastor, I mean, I'm just here for biscuits and gravy and a little bit of a good sermon. <laughs> what I'm telling you, the more time you spend receiving God's grace through the living word and the incarnate word, your will is going to change. It's going to start to line up with God, and you're going to find yourself saying stuff, doing stuff you never thought you could do. Amen. And you'll be proud of it. I mean, not proud in like, look at me, because we don't want them people. You'll be proud of it in the sense you're like, hey, I'm maturing. And when you realize that you're actually maturing, tears are going to fall. Tears are going to fall. Because you recognize that ain't of me. That's God doing that stuff. That's God doing that stuff. Is that a good place to stop? That's a good place to stop. All right, let's pray. Lord in heaven, I love you. Lord, you're an amazing and an awesome God, Lord. Lord, we're, we're hungry for you. Lord, our hearts are open, our minds are open, our, 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 our bodies are open for you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would heal us, that you would empower us, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit in such a way that we recognize that we belong to you. We don't belong to anything else. Nothing. 
God's people said. Amen. We have a sing song, honey, or a meditation.